Okay, um, I can start. I'm Margaret. I'm a rising senior at New Trier, and I'm the 2A. I'm Colin. I'm also a rising senior at New Trier, and I am the 1A. I'm Dhruv. I'm a rising senior at Chaminade, and I'm the 1N. I'm Ozzy. I'm a rising senior at Chaminade, and I'm the 2N. Awesome. Thank you all. Well, I think we're ready to get started. Um, if you want to send out the docs, Con. Just sent it. Awesome. And I hope all of you attendees are ready to flow. Let me know when y'all have it. Is everyone good? No, you don't have it. Okay. All right. I think everybody's ready now. So whenever you're ready. Now y'all got it. Everyone's good. Okay. The advantage federal death penalty can be triggered by 60 different offenses and the DOJ is intervening to take over state cases. Federal cases receive weaker review and disproportionately target black people. That's Segura 19. Bar announced Trump would restart executions if executions proceed it's going to be black person after black person penalty cases, trauma, mental illness, procedural uh, disasters, young science, death penalty is played by problem 60 offenses punishable by death where state penalty convictions are subject to review at the state level and then by federal courts, federal convictions only get the latter. A major effect of the crime bill was to encourage the DOJ to take over cases that could have been prosecuted at the state level as federal prosecutions ramped up racism became unmistakable disproportionate number of federal death sentences are located in the districts where decision to prosecute transform the jury pool from black to predominantly white, the jury pools get whiter, implicit racial bias increases since Trump took office have seen a sharp spike in capital prosecutions of state crimes by the federal government. Independently, some states will continue killing themselves unless they are forced to stop by the federal government, NYT 17. Leaving it up to individual states is not the solution. States have passed laws to an intended to speed up the capital process. Death penalty holdouts are fiercely committed, won't stop killing people unless they're forced to the court of its responsibility to be the ultimate arbiter. Death sentences and executions are all inherently torturous. The prohibition against torture should be absolute and no circumstance can be used to justify it. Bessler, 19. Capital charges, death sentences, and executions inflict severe trauma. Torture constitutes an affront to human dignity. Credible threats of death or torture. They should not be allowed. Judges, jury should not be permitted to use. No circumstance can be used to justify torture, whereas the crimes of heinous killers and other offenders are reprehensible and cannot be undone. The state's response is a conscious choice. The state crosses the line when it strips offenders of their humanity that traumatizes, stigmatizes, and tortures. Death penalty must be rejected in all its forms. Torture is wrong. The death penalty in the process by which it is administered bear characteristics of torture. This must be rejected in all instances because every human life has value. Death is irreversible and steals the opportunity for improving. That's Davis. 19. Execution never results in justice. A perfect criminal justice system does not exist. Wrongful convictions happen due to a number of factors which are honest human mistakes. At least a wrongfully imprisoned person has the potential to be set free, but the government has the chance to learn from mistakes. Death steals that opportunity. You cannot teach a society that killing is wrong by killing, allowing the government to decide when to end a person's life based on criminal law. Rights is one of the most tyrannical powers the society can grant. Keeping the death penalty as a legitimate form of punishment leaves the door open for politicians to apply it as a penalty for other crimes. The federal government should recognize that every human life is valuable, risking even one potentially innocent person's life is not worth the retribution. Weigh ethics first. The institutional violence and moral disengagement at the heart of the death penalty is the same that facilitates genocide and cleansing the world of those deemed unsafe. That's Johnson 18. Conditions that foster institutional violence operate with particular salience and impact on death row dehumanization emerges as the culmination of instruments of authority. One's conscience must be neutralized in order to carry out violence against a person who poses no immediate threat to one's welfare. One's conscience must be neutralized to allow for the atrocities that are part and parcel of genocide. Psychological mechanisms involved in moral disengagement lead to a temporary and selective shutdown and empathy. That shutdown leads to the objectification that enables genocide. First comes moral disengagement, then neutralization, and finally objectification that makes victims seem like objects. Dehumanization that allows actors to target uh, the target to see the target of violence as an object can create a motive for violence. Capital punishment killed the offender twice, once in death row while awaiting execution, and once again in the death chamber. It is difficult to envision any justification the destructive personal impact of death row confinement. No reform, however, can change the fundamental realities of confining and killing processes as they unfold from a human rights perspective. Both the penalty and the awaiting are intolerable. A respect for human dignity is necessary to sustain the essential meaning of being human. Without it, tyranny, war, and ecological collapse are inevitable. That's Weiwei, 19. When we abandon efforts to uphold human dignity, what follows is corruption, tyranny, humanitarian crisis, moral failures accompanied by painful realities. Our living environment is constantly being degraded. Armed conflicts persist. Autocratic regimes brutally impose their will. Human rights are shared values when abuses are committed. Dignity of humanity as a whole is compromised. Conjunctive fallacy means each internal link is less probable than the last. Piatelli, Paul Marini, 94. As the narrative unfolds, one event is linked with another, making for a script that seems plausible. We leave statistics and enter the domain of pure fiction. Cognitive science shown us that a story can lead us to, to can lead us to hold as objectively probable events we would have considered totally improbable, offering a plausible sequence of events that are causally linked has the effect of raising our 
overestimate a probability, even if the probability of the very first link in this chain is low, the fact is soon forgotten. The probability of the last link in the chain being true is calculated on the basis of a series of emotional pro conditional probabilities being the probability of the entire chain is always the less probable than the probability of the least probable link in the chain. A probability-centric framework best protects future generations. Karnofsky 14. Claim that a possibility of a populated future dwarfs all other moral considerations backed by little other than speculation minimize existential risk would include any contribution to general human empowerment it is rational to make smaller positive difference whether or not one can trace a specific causal pathway to making a large impact on the future. Taking strong opportunities to do something good is better than taking actions whose value is contingent on high uncertainty arguments. Acting on short-term considerations have done good in ways that we wouldn't have been able to foresee. Trying to accomplish tangible good can lead to positive developments contributing to general human empowerment mitigates global catastrophic risk. Thus the plan. The United States federal government should abolish the death penalty because it is a violation of human dignity. Contention two is solvency. Centering abolition around dignity allows anti-death penalty efforts to continue the project of radical slavery abolitionists. It is the only strategy that addresses the root of injustice in the criminal justice system and affirms that no life is worth less than another. That's Malkani 18. Both slavery and the death penalty are institutional manifestations of the belief that some people's lives are worth less than others. Abolition should be centered on dignity rather than on pragmatic death penalty discourses, a non-radical approach risks entrenching values at the root of the problem with capital punishment. Abolitionists recognize each and every life is innately valuable. The work of prison abolitionists is instructive. It is not the contention that wholesale change can be brought overnight, but rather to develop framework for bringing about changes in the future. Capital punishment today is a manifestation of the beliefs we abolitionists are trying to eradicate. Criminal justice revolves around some lives is not as valuable as others. Legacy of slavery has tentacles around American life, but, uh, although abolition of the death penalty might only unwrap one of the tentacles, the process framed in the language of dignity could be the precursor to the unwrapping of others. So framing the death penalty as a violation of human dignity provides the tools to challenge the focus on retribution that sustains other harsh punishments, and it allows us to fall in sync with global anti-death penalty movement. That's Kleinsterber et al. 16. Abolitionists need to change the framework if they want to make sustained progress. They need to adopt a frame that focuses on human rights. Otherwise, they will be left with another cruel and ineffective punishment in its place. Only by adopting a human rights framework will it be possible to question the goal of punishment and alter the retributive focus of the current American penal state. The anti-death penalty movement adopted a framework used it to challenge a host of other harsh punishments. This frame empower abolitionists in a way that opens up doors to attacking other excessively punitive sanctions and expands opportunities. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Colin, for that Pitch Perfect 1AC. Very easy to understand and a good role model for all of you. All right, so now we've got a cross-examination from the second negative. Okay, Colin, are you dead? Yes. Okay, so I want to start with talking about the advantage. So we've mm -hmm. recently reduced death penalty cases. That's caused a shift to those people being sentenced to life in prison without parole instead. Why does that same transition not occur in the world of the ash? Sure. So the Kleinsterber 16 card sort of outlines how the human dignity precedent that the plan establishes would spill over into the abolition of other punitive punishments like life without parole, which sort of have the same um, issues in terms of like the psychological torture that's inflicted on defendants that the death penalty does. Can so you the, explain um, a little bit more how exactly it spills over? Sure. So we would say that ruling that the death penalty violates human dignity would have implications for the way that the death penalty is considered under the Eighth Amendment, which would spill over to punishments like life without parole being also deemed infractions of human dignity and therefore being abolished. Okay, that makes sense. So states have separate government authorities than the federal government. How does the AF resolve state prosecutions using the death penalty? So we would say that state laws have been, can be like appealed and so like they can be reviewed on a federal circuit, whereas federal decisions are absolute. So in that way, if you solve for like the federal jurisdiction that eliminates it at the state level. Okay, that makes sense. I will I can add something. The plan would um, use a Supreme Court ruling mechanism, which would spill over to implicate the state's ability to use the death penalty as well. Okay, I want to talk about that Supreme Court ruling in the context of the way it affects the whole spillover to life without life and parole, actually that's fine. So the sort of framing arguments about ethics coming first, what risk of nuclear war is large enough to be considered? So we would say that the risk of nuclear war, I mean, we will, like, we would say that probability has to come first because defaulting to a magnitude like nuclear war means that we can never really make decisions because there's always a looming existential threat which overrides our impulse to make policy corrections because it's just too scary to do anything when there's some like contrived internal link chain that could result in that uh, impact. Yeah, so I, we would say that if you win the probability of nuclear war is equivalent to the probability of the app solvency uh, or, or even like marginally so, then we can have a debate about which would impact more people. But until then, we would say that the judge should default to weighing probability first. Okay, that makes sense. The way way card speaks to how structural violence is the sort of cause of larger forms of violence. 
how would structural violence explain things like Trump killing Soleimani and the potential sure. of Taiwan China wars? Well? Trump killing Soleimani is actually sort of a perfect example of the state enshrining its ability to sort of execute people at whim, which is also ingrained in the ethics that uphold the death penalty. So sort of sanctioning the state's right to uh, take away life whenever it pleases is what upholds uh, instances of abuse like that. But we would also say that the Johnson 18 card talks about how when we morally disengage and allow people to be sentenced to death by the state, it creates the same sort of logic that enables genocide. And so it would also prevent those kinds of abuses. Awesome. I said, oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go for it, uh, okay, I sent out the one and see document. Just give me some sort of affirmative signal when you're all ready. Uh, Colin, you good? Okay, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. All right, take it away. What's the roadmap? Oh, four off and then case. Okay. I'm sorry, you got cut off just for a second there, Drew. Can you repeat the roadmap? Oh, four off and then case. Thanks. Okay. First off is the 2020 elections. It said Biden will win now, but it's not inevitable. That's Norval and 611. Trump is having horrible opinion polling since Floyd. Approval rating is plummeted by an average of 10 points, as well in key battleground states. 47% strongly disapproved. Smog Support among older voters and white working class is eroding. Younger voters are warming up to Biden. Trump trails among female voters by 25 points. If the election were held tomorrow, Trump would not survive, but it's still five months away. Americans can no longer ignore police brutality. Remember 2016. The plan gives Trump a key accomplishment on CJR. It's a salient issue that flips the election. Chung in 19. CJR became an issue in 2020. Trump announced, pronounced himself to be responsible for CJR because he signed the First Step Act. Trump is an opportunist taking advantage of the void. Those running are underestimating the importance. 64% of Ohioans believe that CGS needs improvement. 70% of Democrats and 60% of independents must be integral to the candidacy, needs substantive policy. It's, a vote, it's an issue voters care about. The AF gives Trump a new weapon to attack Biden's biggest weakness, criminal justice, Rice 20. He's led Trump in most polls. Trump has other avenues, appeals to black voters, criminal legal reform, and pardon powers. Appeals will resonate with black voters in swing states where the slightest ship could cost them the region. Trump's re-election permanently collapses the U.S. leadership, leads to global instability and great power nuclear war. Right in 20. For decades, grand strategy was characterized by a bipartisan consensus on U.S. role. Trump has questioned the utility of alliances and forward military presence. He has dissipated little regard for, Trump, for Trump's views are not shared by leading Republicans. But if Trump wins re-election, that could change quickly as he'd feel more empowered. Trump could pull out of NATO by dissolving alliances, aggravate major power conflict. Progressives arguing for retrenchment is a false promise. First, retrenchment would worsen regional security competition in Europe and Asia. Second problem with retrenchment involves nuclear proliferation. Conflicts have a greater chance of spiraling out of control. Third, retrenchment would heighten nationalism and xenophobia. Fourth problem concerns regional stability, most likely end in spheres of influence. Next off is the abolition critique. Criminal justice reform is a superficial and deceptive attempt to perfect the prison industrial complex. The language of bureaucratic policy is one that drinks blood. Kerry Kassanis in 19. The movement for reforming prisons does not even seem to have originated in recognition of failure. The system is broken only to the extent that one believes its purpose is to promote well-being. If the function of the system is to preserve racial and economic hierarchy, then the bureaucracy is performing well. Language is a suit of armor polished as chalk and glitter. The criminal justice reform consensus is superficial. Those who want to preserve the current punishment must obfuscate the difference between changes that will transform and tweaks. They focus on public conversations on the margin. The alternative is a radical disidentification with a state of affirmative politics in favor of abolitionism. Only separating our efforts from reformist causality management can challenge the genocidal war on black, brown, and indigenous bodies, Rodriguez and eight. Behind reformist struggles is an unspoken politics of assumption. Despite imprisonment, repression, and violent policing, the established left does not care to envision the abolition of U.S. domestic warfare. Generations will emerge against this living apocalypse. How could we live with ourselves in a domestic state of emergency? What were the fundamental concerns of our progressive organizations? We require a scholarly activist framework to understand that the state can be radically confronted by an abolitionist politics. The establishment left remains unwilling to address the question of social survival. Storytelling is inseparable from on the ground rearranging and recommitting resources. The process of producing the state is active, tangible, identifiable structure of power and dominance is what scholars call statecraft. Leaders must reflect on how they must actually be supporting and reproducing racism, white supremacy, state violence, and domestic warfare. A historical moments is just the need for rupture. And one political move is overdue and progressive identification within the creative possibilities of insurgency. The abolition of domestic warfare and essays a rigorous theoretical and pragmatic approach to counter anti-state radicalism the political shift that requires a sustained labor of radical vision next off topicality no courts interpretation an act excludes court action scalia and two 
The court's plan was not enacted. Mississippi enactment is a product of legislation by adjudication. Litigation is a consequence of failure to enact. Violation, the affirmative uses the Supreme Court. Voting issue for one, limits. There's tons of possible court asks which make the topic too many apps for the negative to keep up and two ground. They leave no negative ground because disadvantages do not link to their app. Next off is the Constitutional Convention kind of like. Pursuant to Article 5 of the Constitution, at least two-thirds of states should call a constitutional convention, and at least three-fourths of states should ratify a constitutional amendment that abolishes the death penalty, life without parole, and solitary confinement in the United States. The amendment should be exclusively, limited exclusively to this issue, and no state should ratify proposals for additional constitutional changes and other issues. That solves this building momentum for its conviction on death penalty, which ensures a limited nature, is effective. Make in 18. The Supreme Court is unlikely to conclude the death penalty is unconstitutional. Death penalty would be unconstitutional if the amendment made it so. We are on the brink of a constitutional commitment, even if it's not convened specifically for the death penalty. Article 5 convention can be convened to address these amendments. The proposal will be the most redeeming aspect of constitutional convention. Majority vote, which has supported a death penalty abolition amendment, likely given that 19 states have already abolished it. American support for death penalty has dipped to a level not seen in years. Only half favor the death penalty. The nation is at a tipping point. 36 states declining to engage in executions over the past years were to ratify only two more needed. Case. First is framing. Prioritize existential risk. Any risk is a reason to air neck. Bomb and Barrett. And 18. Some catastrophes are vastly more important than others. Humanity could go extinct. Loss would be all future generations. 500 trillion may be an underestimate. Evaluating GCR some risk equals probability times magnitude. Society should try 500 trillion times harder to prevent a global catastrophe than to save a person's life. Evaluating everyone equally suggests a very high value for reducing GCR. Probability of an existential risk is exceptionally high. Taurus in 17. Live in the most dangerous period of human history. Number of existential risks has increased significantly. Civilization has a 50-50 chance of surviving the century. Average American is 4,000 times more likely to encounter a civilization collapse than to die in aviation mishap. Thanks to Trump, doomsday clock advances towards midnight. Experts believe threat to be significant. Even if things are complex, we can still use linear decision-making to make valid predictions. Fitzsimmons and seven. Burden of proof belongs to the decision-maker who rejects evidence. Predictions might be explicit assumptions that constitute decision-maker's belief might remain implicit. Transparency should heighten sensitivity towards changes that suggest the need for adjustment. Risk-oriented approach is a model for planning. Alternative precludes strategy, unskepticism, marginalized analysis, and undermined flexibility. There's no root cause arguments. Calculations are complicated, but even if it causes other genocide, their evidence is not reverse causal to say that they can solve for those genocides. The case proper. States solve now, and Supreme Court will inevitably. Von Troll in 19. California governor announced it will not pursue execution. The governors of Colorado, Oregon, Pennsylvania renounced the death penalty. From New Hampshire to Wyoming, lawmakers are advancing bills to end capital punishment. Change is likely to register on the Supreme Court. It's replaced with life without parole. No spillover. Miller and Hollow at 20. The continuation of the punishment focus mindset will stand in the way. We have to end our culture. Scalia recognized an innocent person is infinitely better off challenging a death sentence than a life sentence. Same risk of wrongful convictions but a person will obtain more legal assistance to the death sentence. Racial imbalances are stark in LWP. The sense of being dead while you're still alive. If draconian punishments are an option, they'll be disproportionately used against POC. New federal executions will be tied up in court over injunctions. Gaza in 19. Bar directs government to use a new protocol over one drug. Protocol end up in court and delay executions since injections has been suspended by lawsuits since 2005. Even with federal reintroduction, the death is still a major decline globally and nationally because of state action. Fall it in 19. Governments ordered death penalty to be reinstated. Change goes against the trend towards fewer executions. 21 states have abolished the death penalty. In many states where executions are still legal, none have been carried out for years. The execution rate has been falling for centuries. No spillover. Tons of other countries have the death penalty. There's no unique reason why the U.S. is the linchpin. Abolition won't spark a wider acceptance of human dignity or reverse mass incarceration. Stryker and Stryker in 20. It seems doubtful that American abolition represent an acceptance of norm of respect for human dignity. Abolition will be rooted in more pragmatic concerns, even without capital punishment, the use of other harsh punishments, and the maintenance of other conditions of incarceration stand in the way. Dismantling the death penalty will not do much to reverse American imprisonment. I'm good for cross-ex. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I think you all noticed during that speech that because the order was four off case and then on case, there were four flows that needed to you know, have notes taken on them. In addition to a whole bunch of responses on the case flow that you use for those 1AC. All right, so now we're gonna have a cross-examination by the 1A while the 2A is preparing their speech. Hey, Drew, are you good? Yeah. 
So I'll start on the elections to add the normal 611. I'll read you a few car lines from it. Quote, fully 47% strongly disapprove Trump's words, tweets, and actions during the coronavirus pandemic and its economic fallout. And now the unrest over the killing of Floyd by a white police officer cost him among almost all demographics. The president trailing Biden by 14 points among registered voters nationwide. What about the reversal of the death penalty would be sufficient to overwhelm a 14 point national lead that Biden is currently enjoying in polling? So, I think that polling is a bit mischaracteristic of the elections itself. Trump has won elections on the margins by swing states, which our evidence says that a reversal in criminal justice reform would give him. Sure, the but reason... that card says 53% already disapprove of his performance and 47% strongly disapprove. I guess, why is the remaining 3% that would swing the election single issue voters for the death penalty? Uh, the reason is that the, we've isolated those voters as key in swing states, i.e. certain electorates like youth voters, black voters, etc., all exist in swing states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, that would all swing if they saw Trump as a criminal justice reformer. So I don't think you have evidence that those would be sufficient, those specific demographics would swing over the death penalty. No, but the rice evidence, in fact, does say that those swing states are sufficient and says- Okay, the rice evidence also says region. that, quote, Trump signed a bipartisan criminal legal reform bill, the First Step Act, and has been generous with pardon powers. I guess if there are so many uh, voters that are allegiant only to changes on criminal justice, why wouldn't that thump support and mean that they already support him? We will make arguments about why those single policies were not sufficient because they weren't credible. The fact okay, that Trump has a historical animus, is. yes, because it adds credibility to that first step back and previous criminal justice reforms okay. by showing that I'll it's a to trend the towards critique. that the Donald Trump has forwarded. Yes. Okay, I'll go to the critique. The alternative, yeah. who enacts it? Uh, the alternative fiat's existing movements like the Black Panther Party and, and BLM to okay. focus their goals towards abolitionism. Okay, so I guess if those movements exist in the status quo, and a lot of them are opposed to the existence of prisons, why haven't they succeeded? And what does the app do to detract from their success? Because they're not focused on abolitionism in the status quo. They're more focused on individual reforms like the plan. Our argument is that abolitionism needs to be forefronted, and these parties need to dissolve entire so respects. So you see like a mindset system. shift among activists to be more concentrated on abolition? Yes, we fiat that these movements are more okay. focused on abolitionism. They do things like, sure. in the context of conviction, people don't go to courts, they flood courts with insurgents, and judges don't vote. Okay, that's okay. The Constitutional Convention counterplan, constitutional conventions, like the framework of them, has to be approved by Congress before it goes to states for a vote. Do you fiat that Congress would approve that framework? I disagree with that. I think that states can enact a con constitutional convention. States if they can have enact majority a constitutional states. convention, but it has to be ratified by Congress first. So do you fiat no, that No, if three-fourths of the states ratify it, then that's sufficient. The framework still has to be approved, but okay. We'll have that. Okay, I'm sending it now. Awesome, thank you. All right, we got a lively debate across a number of flows. Should be an interesting 2AC. Let's see how the affirmative handles it. Once the document gets out, Margaret's going to give us her roadmap to tell you what order you should put your flow papers in so that you can easily keep up with the speech. Okay, I'm just going to switch my camera. Awesome. Also, notice how she stood up because you should always stand up when you're speaking. Uh, Margaret, do you mind giving us a roadmap? No. So first is case. I'll be answering the advantage. And then, or I guess I'll answer framing first since that was a one in C order. And then the advantage also in a one in C order. Then topicality, the constitutional convention counterplan, the abolition K, and then the 2020 disad. Thanks. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. The death penalty is a state-sanctioned murder and torture of primarily black and brown people. Not only is the act of dying itself violent, but being on death row strips prisoners of their humanity and causes psychological violence that you should weigh 
and your decision calculus. That's the Bessler evidence. The framing debate, ethics first, reject all instances of state-sanctioned murder. Any alternative causes moral disengagement and empathy neutralization, which is used to justify genocide and violence in the future. Society should reject that in all instances. That's the Johnson and the Weiwei evidence. Consequentialism is bad. First is math. Existential risk logic overinflates magnitude and makes probability relevant. That 1% risk logic locks in an action because we can never decide what to combat first. Second, it's a conjunctive fallacy. We can't effectively predict consequences with causal link chains. The likelihood dwindles with each step. That's the Piatelli evidence. Three smaller forms work. We can't effectively predict consequences with causal link chains, which I explained above. That means that small ripples mean the best attempt at solving extinction is incremental form. That's the Cosmark. That's the Cosmark. That's, that's the Cosmark evidence. The last argument, yes, all over. I explained moral disengagement. I explained moral disengagement above, which means it does solve for things like genocide. The, the, the advantage, the, the, the advantage, the court won't solve inevitably. That's the Bonelli evidence. The evidence is doesn't say how the courts would actually rule, which means this isn't an argument. The life without parole turn, link turn, prosecutors use the threat of the death penalty now plea bargaining process to drive up life without parole cases. That's scared 17. The shadow of the death penalty can be effectively used by prosecutors to obtain severe bargains. 95% of criminal convictions are negotiated through plea bargains without the death penalty. No defendant would settle for life without parole sentence. Law professor found the threat of the death penalty increased the changes of plea, the plea, plea agreement by 20 to 25%. Prosecutors use the death penalty in plea bargaining over produces harsh sentences. The plan solves it. It sets a precedent that invalidates mass incarceration, solitary confinement life without parole sentences. That's very 17 judicial application. The death penalty would have important implications for eighth, uh, the eighth, for human dignity under the Eighth Amendment. Abolishing the death penalty is a giant step forward towards the full promise of dignity under the Eighth Amendment. It violates dignity to sentence people of color to death. It also violates dignity to incarcerate them in disproportionate numbers. Perhaps solitary confinement itself is a violation of dignity. And if, and if the death penalty violates human dignity, perhaps life without parole does as well. The court has already prohibited life without parole in the juvenile context. Abolition of the death penalty may pay the way for extending prohibition to adults and encourage support for any punishment about the other punishments that violate human dignity. That's the, that's the client's over evidence. Courts can't block executions. The Supreme Court struck down the challenges and death row independently caused psychological torture. That's Lynch 19. Justice Department asked the Supreme Court to elaborate the resumption of the death penalty after appeals court block. Supreme Court called the court's position fundamentally flawed. The full evidence is not responsive. Even if the youth of death penalty is declining now, but it's still bad because some people are still going to be sentenced to death. Yes, fellow worry, the U.S. is so powerful that it signals to other countries that it is a moral action to take cross crime articulation of spillover from the life without parole turn to the last argument. T enact, we meet Congress would pass legislation that the courts would affirm its constitutionality. Enactments to establish by legal act, court and agency actions are included. That's right. 13, the plain meaning of an act is not so limited as merely defined as to establish by legal and authoritative act. An act is not defined nor is it thought of as an action each of legislators. Courts commonly refer to court and act rules. Cases refer to the court and act rules rather than laws have little significance. Courts have allowed the force of order and so indistinguishable from legislative laws. First, prefer their evidence has no intent to define. It says no law was enacted, which doesn't mean that the courts can enact law. Second, it's over limiting most staff have to include the courts otherwise every team would lose to the state's counter plan third is predictability predictability precedes limits and ground because it defines the research base and our evidence is more predictable there's no ground or limits there's no differential to any core disadvantages and functional limits like the state's counter plan con con and non-enforcement other agent counter plans check reasonability competing interrupts causes a race to the bottom and destroys fairness the constitutional convention counter plan it doesn't solve the act first as president. The plan establishes a broad president that spills over itself other harsh sentences of violent human dignity, but a court ruling is key. That's far as it links to the net benefit of constitutional convention which hasn't happened before, which means Trump would take credit for it. Perm do both. It shields the link to the disadvantage because the government is perceived as complying with the ruling. Perm do the plan through the constitutional amendment. Congress would call for the convention and the state should ratify an amendment that does the plan. It doesn't sever our agent because we still use the federal government. Perm do the plan when the counterplan's amendment is ratified. This will probably take a few years, meaning the delay solves the net benefit. That's Chisholm. Five, the actual ratification can take much longer. 27 is not ratified until 23 years. Like the length depends upon the gravity of the issue. The intensity of the public sentiment should doesn't mean immediate. That's dictionary.com. 10 that should is used to express conditions. Just shall I intend to I shall go later. Condo is a voting issue. Lack of reciprocity and the ability to discuss different options distracts away from an in depth comparison between two policies. Unconnor produces better debates. Delay counter plans are also voted. They steal the app, so it's impossible to garner solvents deficits and they aren't real world. The abolition K framework way the app or perm against competitive opportunity cost alternative to reduce the problems outlined versus predictability. Any other interpretation laws negative private monopoly the unpredictable focus shift by encompassing the 1ac that decreases education kills clash and undermines af research and the 1ac link turn their evidence is about reforms at the same the prison industrial complex the plan directly limits resources allocated to the police and decreases the interactions black and brown communities have with the police perm be both abolishing the death penalty 
is an explicit demand of many abolitionist groups. Combining abolition with the pursuit of human rights dignity creates momentum for future wins by abolitionist movements in the future. That's the Malaki evidence. There are two net benefits to the current first time reforms under abolition is key to alleviate current cultural violence. That's Heiner 03, the line between the former practices and abolition practices not a different one. Long term objectives are not not prevent us from engaging in media struggles to secure the quality of life movement that fails to engage in these struggles that also the interests of Joseph on the side of the, those on the inside the properly abolitionist movement must work to suture the divide. It's key to all solvency. Prisons are, con are constructed via increasingly punitive policy. History proves incremental reform works. That's Lancaster 17 abolitionists and West Jews, which in abolition reform is markedly innocent of history and unconscionable conditions are not inevitable because byproducts of the present day are the results of punitive term. What we need to do is fight for measures of proven effective and consistent with social and criminal justice. Finland had a high punitive penal system after decades and reforms like the country's also so now with less than one tenth of the rate of incarceration. They have excessively, but they excessively rehabilitative claims to the complete abolition of prisons. Unlikely when broad public support, we should strive for working models achieved in social democracies. Demands of demands that attract from the number of prominent social movements, creating a strong base institutions become obsolete, and when more effective alternatives become available, we see no such emergent institutions today. We see examples of systems that have continued reforming, shrinking, and the functions of the prison. The 2020 decide no link. First, the plan goes through the courts. No reason Trump would be credited for the F. Second, other issues overwhelm the economy, pandemic response, police reform, and healthcare. Three voters want comprehensive police reform post George Floyd killing. That's not the F. Trump's executive order or the first step back. Thump the link. Uniqueness overwhelms. Where yellow. That's one you see. Norval six eleven. This murder. George Floyd. They seem part of pictures of the police. They the president. Some pretty one. Trump's moving his company by an average of ten points. Among voters registered nationally, and then one in forty seven percent strongly disapproved Trump's words. He's in action. Some of the growing pandemic and its economic fall cost among all demographics shows the president chilling Biden by fourteen points among registered voters worldwide. Trump will win. That's Musto five twenty nine. Political science professor predicted twenty sixteen is forecasting another victory in that examination. Of the primary race. The primaries are already giving us a lot of information. Trump went very easily. Biden had a great deal of trouble. Strong performance. Primaries gives on the Trump the edge. And Trump has ninety one percent chance of being reelected based on statistical and historical theory. Thumpers and black swans for twenty twenty mean no link. That's Harnowski twenty of sixteen issues. Thirty percent of five rates of important with the twenty twenty healthcare, security, gun, education, the economy. These are priority events that increase the importance of issues. Three quarters say infrastructure is important. Biden also posed the death penalty, which means the plan doesn't meaningfully sway voters. There's no impact to hegemony. Weak U.S. coronavirus response. Previous years of Trump in office all mean the impact should have already happened. Their internal link evidence lists a bunch of potential things that Trump could do, but it doesn't say the likelihood of him actually doing any of them in any single issue wouldn't collapse hegemony or military deployments, alliances, and broader power projection are sufficient to solve convergence of factors, make great power, absolute nuclear deterrence, interdependence, democracy, and norms assign minimal risk their impacts. That's Betwise. 17 nuclear weapons came into existence at the same time. Great power stopped fighting nuclear weapons. This proliferation sold out the cold world. The world has the same number of nuclear states. The number of so sophisticated to generate fear of war, modern integrated markets, contain powerful incentives to peace, economic interdependence, provide strong center for state to resolve disputes, disputes peacefully, peace, peace, among the number of democracies. Markets really fight each other. Because my absent regimes, law and institutions prohibit aggression, wars not occur. The UN can take credit rights. Revolution contributes to the decline of war. All of the above contributes to the way people view conflict itself, removing glory and replacing it with revulsion. The plan will quickly be forgotten by voters because of media saturation. That's Ruben 18. It's unlikely to matter during the Trump era. The sheer volume of news cycles make this a distant memory. Predictions are impossible. Models fail, and it's too far away. That's Beacon 17, 2016. Taught us to assume nothing. Trump on an orthodox campaign and flew in the face of how campaigns are supposed to run the president. Will defy conventional wisdom. Um, mark the credit wisdom. That's where I stopped. The time went off. Awesome. Very impressive 2AC. Lots of stuff the NEG's going to have to uh, deal with. Um, before we get into CrossX, I want to encourage you who are watching, um, if you have any questions about what's happened in the debate so far or about, you know, debate procedure in general, please put them into the Q&A section and I can answer some of them uh, while the second negative is preparing their speech. Um, and I'm sure the second negative is starting preparing their speech now. Um, while the first negative is going to ask some questions of the 2AC. Okay, Margaret, are you good? Mm -hmm. uh, the framing page first. You've made an argument about why the AF ripples or spills over to solve other existential risks. Mm -hmm. How could abolishing the death penalty spill up to resolve things like Trump pulling out of NATO, for example? Um, I don't think the argument is that it solves all existential risk. Rather, our argument is that it's better in the short term to preserve the quality of human life with small incremental reforms. That means that as a society, we're more empathetic and more likely to do things that improve the quality of life domestically. The reason that, hap that, the reason that accesses broader existential risk logic is because it makes us more able to track flaws in society and things that are hurting people and violence and remedy those things, which makes us more, I guess, reflexive and reflective as a society writ large, which means we can better target our policy decisions. Because in a world where we allow the fear of existential risk to dictate what policy we take, it means that leaders are prone to making choices out of anxiety anxiety or taking rash actions because they're scared of conflict, which historically see the Iraq war, immigrant detention camps have all made okay. violence more likely. 
Uh, that makes sense. So then you've said that the plan spills over. Why would a conservative court apply the Eighth Amendment precedent in other areas like life without parole, for example? Well, one, I think that even though the court is conservative, conservative court justices more likely vote to uphold precedent. It's something that conservative justices um, typically do empirically. And so I think that the plan, the plan setting a precedent is still able to spill over even in a world where the court is conservative. And the precedent that the AF sets is that it's an Eighth Amendment violation? Yeah, an Eighth Amendment violation of human dignity is um, wording, I guess, that reflects the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution for cruel and unusual punishment. So it would establish the death penalty as being cruel and unusual punishment. Makes sense. The dissad, the Trump wins card that you've read, says that Trump is head in primary races. Obviously, Trump was the incumbent, so he had the majority of Republican support, while Biden had to go against like 20 different Democratic primary candidates. How, why did those primary race victories translate into winning the general election? Sure. So the Musto evidence uses the primary model. That primary model was actually one of the um, few polling models that were successful at predicting the outcome of the 2016 election. And it says that this evidence says that empirically the best way to determine whether or not someone will win the election is by looking at how easily they win primaries. So it's not just the number of primaries they won, but rather how many votes they have in their favor in those primaries and overall trends within that. The overall, wait, what's the connection between the primaries and the general election? Like, how do those models come to those conclusions? Um, the primary model says it shows, um, I guess, the overall percentages of electoral votes that are likely based on how people vote in certain districts for the primaries. Okay, the Begin evidence is from 2017 and says the election is too far off. The election is now four months away. Why is this assumptive of the status quo? Um, I think the Begin evidence is more about, I guess, Trump's strategy writ large. He's someone who is probably more unpredictable, as 2016 showed us, which means that it's hard to tie certain policies to the results of the election. Some cross X. So while the second negative is preparing, um, I don't see any questions yet. Let's check in with Mrs. Phillips and uh, see kind of uh, if your flows are accurate. Um, one thing I noticed during the second affirmative constructive is that on case, Margaret went line by line, argument by argument, down each uh, case answer or attack that the one and C included. But on the off case positions, Margaret's creating that line of attacks that the two NC and one and R are gonna have to answer because the affirmative is attacking each of the off case negative positions. So let's see if we got the number of on and off case line by line arguments uh, correct on your close. Um, Mrs. Phillips, if you don't mind, uh, Turn on your mic and tell us, how many on-case arguments were there in the 1NC? In the 1NC, there should be 10. Okay. And let's go through each of the off-case and see how many arguments the 2AC made. On elections, there should be 10, I'm pretty sure. On the constitutional amendment counter plan, there should be six approximately. I grouped some of them. So like, for example, the reasoning for condo is all one argument. I didn't break that apart. So some of you might have kind of gotten a little bit of a different number there. Um, on the abolition K, there are about five. Uh, again, I grouped some of the reasoning, like the evidence and explanation for some of the permutations are kind of grouped with the permutations themselves. On T and Act, I actually only have four, but that's because all the reasons to prefer the counterinterpretation are all kind of grouped with the counterinterpretation and not separated out. And like the reasoning for reasonability is all kind of all grouped together. So one thing that I noticed while Margaret was speaking is that when she hit that two minute mark in the 2AC, that was exactly when she moved on to the elections to say, which leads me to believe that given there were 10 arguments on the elections to said, and only five or so on the other off case positions, that this 2AC is probably guessing that the elections to said is going to be the focus of the negative strategy and has allocated time, you know, to focus arguments on those arguments, uh, on that position relative to the others. But coverage is still pretty even in general. Um, are there any other kind of insights, um, Mrs. Phillips, that you think you can draw from the flows that you took? 
I, I think by kind of looking at the affirmative strategy, it seems like the perm and link turn story on the K, for example, seems to be a primary attack. There weren't just kind of like a smattering of random arguments or unnecessary cards uh, against the counter plan. It seems like permutation and theory debates are kind of the primary area that they're focusing um, for that. The elections DA, again, I think the reason there are so many answers on the elections DA as opposed to the other parts of the flows, because that's the net benefit potentially to the con con or constitutional amendment counter plan. Um, and I also noticed at the top of the two AC, there's a little box area that it, it starts with kind of just a description of the app, an extension of the main advantages of the affirmative that kind of happens before uh, Margaret jumps into the line by line, which was very, very smart because then kind of ensures that we're focused on her offense before she starts just kind of answering the framing arguments and then the rest of the flow. But she did it very efficiently. So she didn't repeat herself or spend too much time there. I thought that was good. Uh, and then T and act, she, I think it was also smart that there's like a we meet and a counter interp because she can go different directions, calls into question whether or not the definition of an act is actually exclusive in the we meet. And then in the counter interp uh, has a legally precise definition. So I thought that was also really good. Yeah, I think overall, this is an exemplary 2AC that I think is a really good role model to emulate, especially because I, this is a personal opinion, but I suspect that part of the reason that the affirmative is focused on theoretical objections and firms to the counter plan um, is partially due to the fact that the substantive answers in the camp file um, are a little bit weaker. Um, and I think that it's a good decision in this case um, to maybe focus offense in other forms. Um, I don't know, like, I, I guess it's here. Just let me know when you're ready to, to go. But. One last thing I wanted to point out that I thought was really smart is a lot of the cross X questions they had asked come up again in their speech. So think questions about the internal links on the elections day or the uniqueness questions on the elections day become analytics so that they're not forgotten and they're clearly built upon and developed throughout the debate, which again is a, a indicator of a very good debater. Um, the two MCs have been sent out. Just give me a second to set up and then I'll get the order. Awesome, thank you. All right, for those of you watching, don't be afraid to ask questions in the Q&A if you have any. This is a good opportunity to, you know, get into the nitty gritty of what's going on, um, kind of what a debate looks like, all of the, the moving pieces that you get to observe done well um, in this opportunity. And you might not have that opportunity for a little while. Okay, so the order is going to be the Constitutional Convention counterplaying the abolition critique, the framing portion of case, and then the advantage process. Okay, is anybody not ready? The counterpoint solves the app, it ratifies a constitutional amendment that results in the plan, that's me, but it does not result in the disad because it doesn't use the United States federal government, so Trump can't take credit. Prefer sufficiency framing. Solvency isn't a yes, no question. The counterpoint solves enough of the internal links and solvency deficits have no articulated impact, so any risk of the disadvantage outweighs their first argument about precedent. The counterplan solves it. A constitutional convention has never happened before, so one would send a large signal and the courts would rule on it after because the constitution has been changed. The links to the net benefit argument, it doesn't lead to the net benefit. Trump obviously can't take credit for it because it's a state reform, not a federal government one. Permutation, do both links to the net benefit. Constitutional conventions take time. The setup 
hearing of suits and discussions that ratification happens post Supreme Court decision. The plan has to be immediate, should mean to must, and requires immediate legal effect that summers and that before should should mean the same as let's raising that some laws immediately effective as opposed to effective in the future. Allowing them to bypass the sequency question would make the plan sever immediacy or intrinsic through a time frame left to voter because it allows them to shift despite links. The next firm also severs immediacy, which was explained above. The next firm delays the app, which also severs immediacy, which was above. The conditionality argument condo is good. We get two. We won't classify contradictory answers as superior. One is to AC pressure, forces strategic thinking, considering argument interaction and tactical choices is a key skill. Two is net flex. We need to test the act. They get infinite prep. The act is eight minutes of offense against the status quo. The P2 ACs, one AR leeway, and the last speech. Three is information processing. Conditionality forces education on a wider range of issues, which encourages research beyond generic. Skew is inevitable. We could have had more TRK. Arguments in every advocacy is exponentially less valuable. Reject the argument, add on terms, and to AC choice check. Conditionality also justifies any other theory concerned for the same reasons, but at worst, you should reject the argument, not the team. The counter plan isn't a delay counter plan, so it's not justified. Their offense assumes only a delay counter plan, but we use a different actor and process, which makes it competitive. Court keywords or USFG keywords are responsive, which means that they can answer it. The abolition critique. Concede the permutation is just a test of competition. We're not going for the critique, and there's no offense on this flow. The framing page. Prioritize existential threats. First is reversibility. It affects all future lives. It's irreversible and a prerequisite to solving any of the app impacts. You shouldn't risk it too. Is it psychological bias goes neg? We psychologically disregard large impacts because they're difficult to imagine. Flip that bias and presume towards preventing a speech in three. We access their framing that are war is violent. It causes pandemics, poverty, et cetera, and scarcity of resources fields every system of oppression. It happens on a larger scale and polarizes all minority groups. That means that at any existential risk at worst serves as a tiebreaker. Everyone's death is obviously much, much more unethical than that of a select few. So we just need to win that our scenario happens. That should be determined based off specificity. They have generic evidence about probability and internal link chains, but we have incredible evidence showing that our scenario is uniquely and specifically likely. They're first talking about ethics. Ethics is tautological. It's unethical to let everyone die and let the structural violence be a war to occur. Any reason to prioritize their impact leads back to probability, which was a, which was above, but nothing is always bad. Killing is bad in retrospect, but if someone killed Hitler, they could have prevented mass dehumanization and death, proven by how if ending the death penalty meant the enslavement of millions, it wouldn't be the best choice. Their argument here about the root cause, decision calculus, for war is compl complicated. It occurs because of economic incentives, rivalries, miscalculation, etc., and not just structural violence. But winning that they do affect the root cause of war doesn't matter unless they want a reverse causal argument about how they resolve that. Ask them a solution to all inequalities. You should air towards preventing specific instances of war because they don't resolve war. Ours, the next argument is about low probability. It's not. Our scenario is not low probability. They don't have evidence saying that our scenario is improbable, just that improbable scenarios are bad. The dissad is obviously distinct from the claim that you could die getting coffee because we have evidence for our argument, but even if it is, the risk of it means that it should come first. That's best because the impact is far worse. Even if that's not a superior model broadly, it's best for governments and uncertainty is inevitable. That's good. In 1995, public officials are obliged to make choices on their uncertainty. All choices are made under some degree of uncertainty. Part of the individuals are more complete info. They no averages and aggregates use the usual calculus, but while it may lead to our impacts, at least to their internal link chains, they're uncertain about whether Trump enforces it, it spills over to life without prison, etc. There's no bright line for how much uncertainty is too far. So, Aaron, Nag, that all answers the Piatelli card about the conjunctive policy, too. It's the same concept about low probability. If they distinguish it and give a reason for why it's different, we get new answers. The next argument about them solving genocide yes, they may solve the genocide in the context of the death penalty and what the death penalty causes, but they don't solve all genocides in the world, which is not, or which is a reason as to why they don't solve the argument as for why genocide causes war, because genocide still exists after the act, the case proper. The court inevitably solves the act. Tons of states are abolishing the death penalty. That pressure forces the court to follow on soon enough to avoid looking disconnected and outdated. That's Bondrail and Make. The federal government 
doesn't matter. Our evidence says that state pressure is sufficient to force them to do so. The, 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 the life without parole argument, there's uh, the app results. The app causes a transition to life in prison without parole. One is public consensus. The punishment mindset of the public forces a shift to satisfy the public. They won't get, they won't let people get soft punishment. Second is government officials. They're looking to expand life without parole now. The app grants them an excuse, an, an excuse to do it. That turns the app. Racial imbalances in those convictions are quantifiably worse and the, and the suffering is categorically worse. Prisoners describe it as, quote, being dead while you're still alive, which is worse than death because you're conscious while being tortured daily for decades. That's all Miller and Harawa. No link turn. It's not about plea bargains, but the structure of life without prison prosecutions, even if they prevent those protections for life without prison anyway are worse. They imprison more innocence than the status quo. That's Garrett and 17. Outside of the death penalty, the criminal defendants are not pertaining to lawyers' investigation that is separate trial and life without prison sentences of scour. We fully argue that any defendant is infinitely better for preparing an appealing death sentence case in life imprisonment than to climb with the death penalty replace it. Move the life for approaching 200,000. Better lawyering can't help resolve many life without prison sentences. Judges have to implement mandatory sentences. That's Garrett and 17. Death penalty lawyers and nonprofits are working to teach life about prison cases that are wrong, cannot impact life by mandatory sentences, money, even on judges. Their next argument, their their next argument about how they solve the precedent, they don't spill over to solve precedents. One, the plan says human dignity, which is not the Eighth Amendment language of quote cool and unusual punishment. So it doesn't set a precedent that can be applied. Second, the court is currently conservative. They'll keep the ruling of the affirmative narrow. They won't take any other CGR cases in which they could rule, in which they could rule in favor of a silver on three. Is Trump loves the death penalty and harsh punishment. You should have a high threshold for it because he'll do anything he can to keep it intact. Death penalty, the death penalty moratorium in the 1970s disproves and should have caused that spillover. That's Conklin. In 19, America would have been more democratic and less racist in the 70s during the death penalty moratorium than in the 90s when the death penalty increased. The life without prison, life in prison is dehumanizing. It, 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 it inmates face a cycle of brutality, and only ending the prison system can resolve it. That's really in 2012, people died in Mississippi as a result of violence between inmates. Their amount of change has been able to break the cycle of brutality, dehumanization, and violence are intrinsic to separating people from the that occurs through prisons. Reform is temporary, prison will always be dehumanized. Awesome, thank you. So we'll discuss both block speeches during the 1 AR's prep time at the end. So right now we'll just go straight into cross act of the 2 at C and then the 1 and R speech afterwards. Are you ready? Um, so on the advantage, you made an argument that the court is conservative, so they'll be more likely to keep the ruling narrow. How does this not contradict your argument that the states getting rid of the death penalty will force the courts to follow on? Yeah, so the distinction is that the court follow on argument is about the death penalty. We've read evidence that says states abolishing the death penalty puts pressure on the Supreme Court to then abolish the death penalty. That obviously doesn't apply to life without parole, life in prison without parole, because the states haven't put that sort of pressure on getting rid of that. But if the court is conservative, it's still not in their values to get rid of any punishment. Yeah, it's not in their values to get rid of the death penalty, but both the bond trail and the NAIC evidence from the 1NC make the argument that state pressure would functionally force them to do so, because otherwise they'd look super disconnected and outdated from current movements. Sure. Um, on the framing page, the argument you made about how this your model is best for governments how do we know what's best for governments and how do we know that governments can always predict consequences accurately? Because it seems to me like there's a lot of empirical examples of us overreacting to things that we thought were threats when they weren't. No, you're right. And that's the point. The good and evidence makes the argument that uncertainty and not knowing what will happen as a result of things is inevitable. That is a reason as to why we should prefer impacts that prefer things that would likely have worse consequences, like not do things that we think might have worse consequences because everything is uncertain. But what, happen in a, what happens in a world where if everything is uncertain and our actions to prevent those existential risk logics cause bigger impacts in the future, i.e. we intervene somewhere to stop an existential risk, but that causes a war. How do we act and how do we decide? I think you're right about the intervention example in retrospect. However, I don't think that applies to the scenario of the disadvantage. The disadvantage prevents things like intervention and, it's, and continued wars, which means that example doesn't really apply to the argument we're making. 
Okay, the Constitutional Convention counterplan yeah. made an argument on that it does um, solve the precedent argument because the courts would eventually rule. How does this mean that um, it doesn't link to the net benefit or that the counterplan uses a different actor if it's still mandating the courts? It doesn't mandate the courts, which is the distinction. The argument is just that if the Constitution was changed, the Supreme Court would at some point in the future have to make a ruling using that portion of the Constitution, in which point it would be codified. That would also happen likely significantly after the 2020 election, which means okay. it doesn't. So the counter plan, though it doesn't mandate the same actor as the plan, it would still yeah. result in the same actor as the plan ruling on the counter plan. It may. Like, we're not mandating it happens, but it is a likely result. Okay. Um, those are my only questions. All right. So now the first negative is going to give this Okay, the order is the elections decide. Is everyone good? Okay. Oh. Call yeah, it. I have to open the speech. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Trump's re-election results in collapse. U.S. leadership retrenchment magnifies the propensity for nuclear war proliferation and terrorism by emboldening China, North Korea, and the Middle East. That's right. Turns human dignity. Trump re-election permanently collapses. White nationalist fascism has hastened in 18 Trump. American democracy is in crisis. Minorities are under fire. We're heading towards a militarized authoritarian surveillance. Say you can't defeat fascism by meeting in the middle. It's resistant at every instance. To call it rhetoric. Behavior is abnormal. It'll be a non-stop struggle against fascism. White nationalism. But forget about partisanship. The charge is only to defeat them. The course of Trump does link to the force because he's tied himself to them. He is appointed two justices, which he takes in pride and boasts to voters. So he'll clear, so clear, take any credit for any criminal justice reform. In fact, he's even gone out and said that every 5-4 decision is because of him. Other issues don't matter. First, it's assumed by our uniqueness. Biden is winning despite these issues, and it's only on the margin. Second is that criminal justice is key. Swing voters are looking towards it because of things like the BLM and pro police protests, and he gives them certain voting groups like black voters and key swing states. That's Chung and Rice. The, the F is what gives Trump a CJR when abolishing the death penalties overwhelming populist subs in 19 this year feels like a turning point for the death penalty conservative groups are becoming really concerned about the death penalty the democratic party is announcing that abolition is on their platform people both from the right and the left are aggressively promoting death penalty to reveal the trump exo thing is made zero change protesters are smart and they know the difference between the plan and trump's fluff that's role in 616 local activists are responding to trump's executive orders saying it's not enough these fluff executive orders are meant to placate protesters and won't and basically don't do anything biden the uniqueness does not outweigh biden victory is only tentative if Norval prices in BLM protests, etc., makes that our argument, which is our uniqueness claim, that Biden will win now because of it, but could easily shift, which is our link argument. Swing voters exist now, and they're key to the election, but then they tentatively support Biden now. It's code. And 19 swing voters are very real. It's enough of them to decide the next election. 15% of electors are battleground states. Their votes are effectively count twice. Not only adds the vote to one side, but also subtracts one from the other. Evidence confirms the decisive role in elections. The electorate remains divided. 9% truly persuadable. These support Biden over the president. Trump loses now. Biden wins by 10 points sustained through key swing states. That's the one in see normal evidence. Their evidence is wrong. It makes claims based on the primaries, which obviously went his way because he went over, he went against way fewer opponents. Biden will win now based on controlling swing states, but Trump has time to set a stage in a comeback. That's Shedlock in 614. Trump could easily lose Ohio, Georgia, Ohio, Iowa, Ohio, and Georgia. You can't afford to lose any of them. It's still early, but it's getting later and later. Biden is ahead in Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ohio. It's not impossible for Trump to win because of the time factor. I have Biden a 65-35 favorite, but Trump's base is not his problem. Swing voters are on Trump the election. They're breaking strongly for Biden. Thumpers do not matter. First, the CJR flips the election. It gives Trump a key CJR accomplishment, which gives him his swing voters in key states. That's Chung and Rice. Second is that their evidence just lists things that voters like, which doesn't answer our argument about swing voters. They haven't read any evidence that says any of these issues will have policies passed on it, which means it does not matter. Third is that Trump is the underdog now, but a bipartisan criminal justice bill allows Trump to win. Cadney's six will have a mouth for months long slide in polls and focus image and deepening doubts will have recast Trump as an undisputed underdog in 2020 election. This is a pivotal 
time. Trump could use lag and six five for the six most important battleground states. Democrats envision the worst case political scenario, economic recovery, the possibility of vaccine, bipartisan criminal justice reform bill to pull Trump across the finish line once again. Fourth is new gains in the black electorate are key to the Trump victory. Parker in two six. Trump is ramping up his appeals to African Americans to lure up down from the Democratic Party. Black voters sway electoral outcomes. Trump would make a Democratic victory much more difficult if he can either increase the share of the black vote or discourage turnout. His support does not appear to have budged. Trump surpassed through swing states and large non-white populations. They only need to carve off a few people to win. Biden's support does not shield. He hasn't taken any actions. While Trump has, the plan establishes Trump as a credible criminal justice reformer, which gives him key electorates. Yes, hegemony impact. Right says that re-election emboldens Trump to take further actions, like pull out of NATO, since there's no political repercussions. They don't have any cards in this question. Re-election is unique. Branson, 18 in the near term, remains unlikely. A NATO experience fatal rupture things that wreckage Trump will depend on whether he serves one term or two. Trump wins re-election. Allies are no longer able to cling to hope that he can get great aberrations. They may conclude that he'll have no choice, but it's preparing him for self for a future which America turns away from Atlanticism. It's hard to envision how NATO will make much progress towards overcoming its current crisis as long as Trump is president. There are no war arguments. Don't assume the world of the AF without institutions, alliances, and nuclear or way more nuclear weapons, which drastically increases the propensity for war. Nuclear war is likely. Beckman in 17, Trump has sold 30 to empty the nuclear arsenal. Ongoing conflicts could go to nuclear anytime. Regional powers are relying on nuclear weapons today to day to security. There may be use or lose situation. We shouldn't accept that MAD should save the day. The risk of was action strikes as free rise from technological errors only takes one domino to trigger an avalanche response. There have been a shocking number of close calls. International trends have the risk of race and surge into internationalism and anti multilateralism. There's a question of commitments that the U.S. has made, encouraging allies to go at it alone. They can only complicate the picture. The more countries have nuclear weapons, the more weapons there are, the more likely the actors are able to use them. Probability just accumulates voters. Don't forget the Rubin evidence is non responsive. It's about news cycles. This better proves the long term impact of policy stance on the election. We have specific evidence by CGR voters who clearly wouldn't forget something that directly affected them. Predictions do work. Their, their election's only a few months away. While their evidence is from 2016, voters look at things directly, at things which directly impact them, like CGR, which was the link explanation that I gave above. Awesome. Thank you very much. So while we let Colin prepare his 1AR, um, let's just do a, a bit of a recap of what just happened. Um, so the, the two neg block speeches that go back to back, the second negative constructive and the first negative rebuttal, um, divided up each of the flows that were active in the 2AC so that the 2NC could get rid of the thing that they were not extending anymore, which in this case is the abolition critique. Um, cover and answer all of the 2AC responses on the counter plan. Um, and remember that that counter plan had fewer responses in general um, than the politics disad did. And so that meant that the 2NC was able to do that and go the line by line down all of the case arguments. And you notice that the 2NC time was about roughly evenly split between those two um, tasks. Um, meanwhile, the 1 and R at that point was only left, the only thing left to talk about um, was the elections disadvantage, and so was able to spend all five minutes focusing on that. And so even on just a purely mathematical, like where was time spent kind of level, you can see that the focus of the negative strategy is the five minutes on the elections disadvantage because the negative knows that they need to win an offensive reason why we should not do the case, and that all of the things that the two NC discussed, answering the advantages, um, comparing um, metrics for how we should weigh and compare the impact claims made by both sides on the case debate, answering the advantage um, itself, the AFS offense that you would be weighing against the disadvantage, and then using a counter plan as a backup strategy to, to neutralize that same AF offense uh, taking the form of the advantage. And so the combination of these creates layers to the negative strategy so that they don't have to win all of these in the 2 and R. They could go for the disad in the case um, with the impact framing arguments. They could go for the disad and the counter plan um, as a way to similarly neut neutralize the AF's impact framing and um, offensive arguments. Uh, and that is a neg block strategy. Um, Another thing I noticed, and we'll have to check in with Mrs. Phillips um, in a little bit to see um, her take on kind of the flows, but I noticed that arrows were drawn at the bottom of her flow when she needed to flip the page over, which you should always flip the flow vertically so that one column in one speech, after you flip it, continues 
down the same side uh, or down in the same place, kind of on the other side, um, which prevents you from seeing one speech through the back of another speech. Um, but anyway, um, it's very important that you write some kind of symbol to indicate that you've done that on your flow. Um, I personally lost the debate because I did not draw an arrow and did not flip my flow over and answer a no negative PR argument. It's very embarrassing. Uh, I would strongly recommend that you have some kind of system like these arrows to indicate you know, when you need to go onto the back of a flow or I've even seen some debates where people needed multiple pieces of paper on both sides to you know, be able to adequately space out um, all of the arguments that were being made on a, a particularly deep debate um, in order to get them all down. Uh, Mrs. Phillips, do you have any other um, insights based on your flows? Um, I don't know if people notice, but I clearly did not leave enough room for the case debate, which does also tell you that the negative block did an excellent job of like expanding the case arguments instead of just extending a claim. Uh, so I probably should have left a little bit more space between uh, the one and C on case arguments, because as you can see, like when I get to the bottom here, all of a sudden these arguments, since uh, Ozzy kind of went through so thoroughly extending the like the uh, the framing parts of the debate uh, and had so many arguments there that then I needed to kind of move some of the uh, life without parole arguments initially on the front of my flow to the back of the flow because I had to make room for those. But the point was that at least I kept it organized, but I could have made it easier on myself. Thanks. Yeah, you'll notice that that arrow that she drew as the symbol to flip the page continues on the back of the page to be like, hey, this whole chunk of paragraph is actually a response to an argument on the other side of the page, right? You, you'll be surprised at, at how stressful a debate round is. You might forget, honestly, looking at your flow if you don't use those kinds of symbols to kind of remind yourself what you were thinking when you were flowing in the first place. Um, another thing I noticed uh, stylistically in terms of the speeches, the two and C uh, did a good job standing up. Always want to encourage people to stand up, even though, you know, depending on how your diaphragm works and stuff like that, you know, you might be more comfortable sitting, but we would encourage you all to stand up while you're speaking. Um, one thing that I noticed though about the two and C, um, and you might have noticed this as well, is that the position of the laptop actually blocked the judge from seeing um, the, the speaker's face. And what I'd recommend that you do, this is very common um, and is certainly not criticism, especially because with a headset, we can understand everything people are saying uh, very clearly. Um, but what you can do to resolve that issue is if you tilt the laptop at an angle and kind of just move your head back and forth like this between looking at the, the camera and looking at um, the laptop or looking at the laptop and then looking down at a flow that's just to the side, um, that would, resolve that issue and that way the judge can you know read your nonverbal expressions there's a lot of communication um, that people unconsciously do non-verbally um, that can be important for judges um, to you know see where you're confident that you're going to win or maybe you're a little nervous um, all of that affects people's perception of debates um, the other thing i noticed about the 2nc is that uh, a lot of the responses that were prepped were were fantastically prepared. And what I mean is we're not, like there's evidence that we're not just thinking about the claims that are being made and generally refuting those ideas, but actually paying attention to what were the warrants, what were the examples that the 2AC gave, and then actually engaging with those examples, saying like these aren't good examples of, you know, for um, this general idea. Sometimes we call that a micro clash or micro line by line. Um, where even within a particular argument, people are doing explicit comparison um, between the reasons given. And I also saw that happening a lot in the 1NR on the politics debate, comparing, for example, um, you know, this model for predicting votes is historically more accurate. All, the, by the way, the AF is also doing this in the cross-ex um, of the 2NC and the cross-ex of the 2AC. Um, but I just wanted to highlight, this is really, I think, how debates are won and lost is in the comparisons between the reasons that are given for the claims that each debater is making in their speeches. It looks like Colin might be ready. I don't want to, okay. Cool. Yeah, I sent out the cards. 
Okay, is everyone good? Oh, oh, you know what? I'll give an order, sorry. It's gonna be framing, then case, then the compound counter plan, and then the disapp. Is everyone good? Ethics first, the death penalty is inherently torturous. Rule utilitarianism dictates that we, you have a presumption against harming human dignity via state sanctioned murder. We don't solve other genocide logic because moral disengagement means countries are more likely to kill each other. Uh, even if we lose ethics and they win util, probability first is key to effective policy making and risk reduction. One, anything else causes decision paralysis because infinite things could cause extinction at any given time. We will never be able to choose which to prioritize because causal link chains are fundamentally flawed, which justifies short term violence. Second, existential risk logic justifies brash anxiety driven policy making, which is net worse. It results in arms racing, the Iraq war, immigrant detention camps, et cetera, which means they're model justifies bad policymaking. Third, that means the polit policymaking should follow generalizable rules that improve the overall quality of life, which is a better internal link to solving extinction. That's Kazmarek. They don't access the reversibility claim if we prove the, if we disprove the disad. Cognitive biases flow out because the death penalty results in widespread moral disengagement that normalizes staying sanctions, torture, and murder. War hurting minorities is irrelevant. Our framing is that you need to prioritize the ethical frame that we have presented, and we will disprove the disadvantage. Yes, it is unethical to let people die, but our argument is that it is best to a specific model of moral framework and operate under it. It is worse for governments. I explained that above. I'll go to the, um, the the, the good debate doesn't matter because no, none of their authors would affirm the entire internal link chain. And conjunctive fallacy is not just about their internal links, but the other actors that would intervene before a great power war conflict. The advantage, no pressure for the courts to follow on. This evidence is about lethal injections being banned, but it doesn't. But it does not make the argument that the court will never comply. Even then, delays and a reason to vote negative. LWOP turn one, link turn. LWOP sentences will decrease post out because prosecutors use the threat of the death penalty to coerce inmates to choose the less harmful option, which is life without parole. In the world of the plan, other punishments would be used to deter people from, from accepting LWOP, which is Garrett and the two and C didn't answer it. Conservative courts vote to uphold precedent, which means that we solve. We also solve public pressures because we forward to human rights ethics, which means states comply. Second, the plan solves the turn. Upholding respect for human dignity means that any form of strict cross-world punishment, like the death penalty and WLP, are cruel and unusual punishment. It isn't justified wording in the Constitution, which means the plan creates momentum for the courts to strike down LWOP in future instances, which solves. That's Barry and Kleinstaber. All um, the mandatory minimum only applies if convicted, which the plea deal process obviates, and the punishment mindset turn in the government officials doesn't apply because that doesn't impact court rulings, which are immune from those political pressures of the constituency. I'll go to the CONCON debate. First, perm do the counterplan and the plan after, and perm do both. I'll group their theory responses. Perm do the counterplan and plan afterwards shields any risk of the dishab because the court decision to uphold the amendment is non-controversial and practically obligated, which means the court doesn't soak or it doesn't get PR or progressive time, should express this condition rather than immediate effect, which means it doesn't have immediacy. That's dictionary.com. There isn't any compelling truth word on what these words mean. So default to debatability. Their interpretation allows the neg to tack on any random process or delay to the plan and call it competitive. And we can't get offense off of tiny delays, which is bad for model for debate. It's bad for three reasons. One, destroys any predictable clash, which means we can't predict infinite counterplan mechanisms which waste months of AF prep and dismantles in-depth educational debating, which is key to advocacy skills and clash. Second, disincentivizes neg research because they only have to find one contrived net benefit versus every app, which ruins flexibility and, nu and nuanced argumentative strength. Third, it ruins topic education because process debates crowd out the substance of criminal justice reform. Limited intrinsicness is good to test if a counterplan is an opportunity cost or which means it's better a model for debate and our impacts outweigh. No impact to severance. Counterplans that can beat off immediacy are a bad model in case they cross apply air neg from the condo debate. Air app. Most CGR is done at the state level, which makes that finding Fed key apps impossible. The non-enforcement counterplan and the counterplan make and, and this counterplan make this topic harder to be affirmed. Of any outside biases offset by the block um, in condo. The sufficiency framing, no. Cross apply the framing argument. This is magnitude first, even in disguise. Even a small deficit outweighs the DA's probability. Um, I'll go to the 2020 disad. First, extend the XO thumper. Trump's executive order thumps the link. The link evidence is not about the AF, rather about general criminal justice reform, which moderate voters will flip for Trump as he campaigns on it close to the election. Second, their evidence doesn't establish a link threshold. The answer to the thumper isn't supported in their evidence, but movement leaders not liking the XO won't implicate moderates. There isn't a compelling answer to this coming out of the block. The turns case argument. White nationalism won. Their card is talking about the first four years of the Trump presidency, which means that it's already non-unique. But second, those people are already emboldened, which means that the people who subscribe to white nationalism have already entered the public forum and aren't going to be suppressed just by a democratic president. The Trump take credit argument, one, that means that the counterplan links to the net benefit. But two, if they win that it doesn't, the post Louisiana ruling and uh, DACA and the um, gay and trans rights ruling, it means that Trump can no longer take credit for the court because it looks like they're openly defying them. The black vote key link arguments, one, it just says that black votes are key, not that they'll be persuaded by what Trump has done. But second, the XO thumper should cross apply here. If black 
voters only care about criminal justice reform, then that should have already should have already triggered the link. The black swans argument and thumpers also take out the link in uniqueness. One, pollers were asked what key issues the, to the election were that included healthcare, guns, education, infrastructure, and the economy, which means CJR isn't enough to flip voters. That's Hermanowski. Second, Trump is unpredictable and lacks a clear strategy, which means that voter priorities can always change and predictions fail. They said they didn't, he didn't act on those, but that's not true. He did act on the economy just disastrously. The coronavirus is taking it out, which means that voters are already anti-Trump. Also, not acting on gun control is a political stance in and of itself because he refuses to implement policies even after mass atrocities. The our only answer to the exo thumper is that protesters know the difference. If that's true, then they won't care about the death penalty affirmative because they know that it's distinct from, from regulating questions of police brutality, which is what they're upset about. Next is the shelf life argument. People will forget. Stormy Daniels, the Soleimani execution, etc., all prove that people that the electorate has a limited attention span. Finally, is the is the great power war obsolete argument. They just said that re-election changes the decision calculus, but that's not true. Allies have stuck it out for four years of the Trump administration, which means that they can go on for another term and they know that they know that his presidency is finite, which means they'll stick it out till the end of the second term. Awesome. All right. So now the second negative is going to prepare the 2NR, which will be the last negative speech. So we get to see some moves being made. The 1AR had to spread on their time uh, across all of the different flows in the debate. Hopefully the debate's about to get a little bit smaller as people collapse and maybe choose whether to focus. Uh, we talked earlier about layering answers um, to the affirmative's offense, uh, which is the advantage now. Um, so now we'll get to see, you know, are they going to focus on life without parole in the case debate as a form of offense or the elections to set? Are they going to focus on answering the case um, or the uh, counter plan as a way to neutralize the apps offense? So got some strategic questions, moves to be made. Uh, hope you also realized how difficult it is to flow a 1AR um, when the 1AR is doing two things. One is speaking in short choppy sentences, uh, trying to spend no more than the least necessary number of words to communicate the strategic ideas. Um, and I think um, Kala did an excellent job of that. Uh, really fantastic um, kind of packager of a lot of complex ideas on the case and off case positions. Um, but then also um, embedded clash, meaning while almost every other speech and debate is is going to be expected to say, you know, they said these things, here are my responses, and that's certainly a, a pretty easy uh, signpost that helps people follow along. In this case, the 1AR does not always have the time to do that, and advanced debaters who are very careful in what language they choose um, can instead communicate that sort of structure or organization to the speech by um, wording the argument packages that they're extending as responses to what the, the negative team has said. So rather than say like, they said life without parole is worse, it's life without parole is not, or you know, we, our precedent resolves life without parole. Um, and you know, they're able to communicate that organization to you without necessarily spending unnecessary amounts of words. I would recommend that those um, are still kind of learning how to go uh, an effective line by line and learning the reputation script, meaning, you know, identifying what claim you're answering, making a counterclaim, warranting that counterclaim with a reason, um, all of which I think the one area did an excellent job of, as did all the negative and aspects before it. Um, let's check in with Mrs. Phillips and see if she has any insights based on the flow. Uh, I don't know that I have much more to add. I think Colin did an excellent job of Embedded Clash. Um, he also, one thing I want everyone to note is at the top of the disad, he extends the two AC arguments in the line by line, but makes a very conscious effort to answer the turns case argument that was added at the top of the impact debate in the 1NR. So the 1NR, if you know, if you're looking at your flow and we're able to get an accurate flow, does some impact work here at the top, talks about the collapse leadership, how that affects the Middle East and terrorism and in general and a couple other things, and then uh, reads a card about how Trump win, you know, galvanizes uh, white nationalism and fascism. And 
So Colin does a good job of making sure to answer that case turn at the top of the flow so that he doesn't, um, it doesn't hurt, come back to hurt the two AR uh, in later on. Um, so that was, is really, really important. But also notice that when he is extending arguments and using embedded clash, he's very careful to use the exact language of the 2AC. So for example, uh, no link, the courts won't get attributed to Trump uh, and that he ultimately will not take credit and then tries to answer some of the warrants that Drew gives in the 1NR for that and kind of moves through and then talks about like the XO thumping and one thing also to notice about the way that he extends arguments on the elections DA is he, he's careful to extend the actual 2AC argument, but then puts it in a context of the story of the disadvantage. So he especially does this on the link debate when he's talking about uh, black voters and he's talking about how black voters and also people who are single issue CJR voters um, are, are going to know the difference between police brutality and what the affirmative is doing with the death penalty. And so making some of those more finite, or not finite, but more uh, nuanced distinctions between why these particular voters might or might not be swayed by something like the affirmative, essentially putting that link debate in the context of the internal link debate and the issues that are brought up in the uniqueness debate. So I thought that was very good. Awesome, thank you, that was really insightful. Um, Looks like Ozzy might be ready. One thing while she's getting set up that I noticed, and, and I could be wrong, but I think we just witnessed the um, first affirmative phone calling the second affirmative during prep time so that they could discuss their strategy for the 2AR and kind of what arguments to pay most attention to in the 2NR, which is excellent. And I want to strongly encourage you all to have some method of communicating with one another even if you know you're in very different places geographically. All right. So take it away, Ozzy. Okay. The order is the 2020 disadvantage the Constitutional Convention kind of plan, the framing page, and then the advantage proper. Is anybody not ready? Okay. The disadvantage outweighs the act that causes nuclear war, which is much, much worse than the 66 deaths from the death penalty, the, which will be explained a bit more in framing countries like North Korea, Russia, and China escalate because Trump is silly and causes conflicts with them. It turns the act independently. Trump re-election hurts human dignity. He's a racist who's done things like put children in detention camps, etc. He's already done bad stuff for re-election. Makes it uniquely worse because there's no political cost for him to go all in because he doesn't have to worry about being re-elected again, which answers their non-unique argument because it gets worse because he doesn't have to worry about political cost. The exo bumper is silly. It didn't actually cause material change. Voters, you know, voters know the difference between fluff and real policies, which is what the roll card is about. This does not apply to the affirmative, though, because while the exo was a purely symbolic thing, the affirmative would cause material change by preventing people from dying from the death penalty. The preventing people from dying from the death penalty. The next argument about movement leaders and not and not applying to movement leaders is a uh, wrong because the debate because the exo created a sort of free for Trump. It created the perception that he wants to do CJR reform, but it's still not incredible because he simply hasn't done enough. The app lets him do more, which uh, creates, which cements the perception of him being actually helpful. The link debate, I'll explain why the app, why the app causes re-election right here. One is they flip swing voters with co-evidence. It says that swing voters are necessary 
necessary for the election and they can determine the election alone. It means none of their no-link arguments apply because swing voters uniquely look to CJR, uniquely look to CJR for the steps. Evidence is specific to the death penalty. It says that it's a top concern for everyone. So the death penalty uniquely, uniquely flips voters, which answers all of their other issues and EXO arguments because it's a argument about the app, specifically the black, and they also flip black voters who care about CJR because it affects them personally. Those are also sufficient to flip the election, the black swans and other issues. They do not matter. One is that CJR is more important. You should look to the current climate, BLM, protests, etc. means that all eyes are on CJR. Even if the app isn't that sort of reform, it creates the credibility that Trump may do that sort of reform in the future because he's acting on CJR. Second is that priorities don't change for key CJR voters, we've read evidence that swing voters and black voters are necessary and that their focus is on CJR. They don't have evidence that that'll shift, so you should reject it. People obviously don't forget about something as important as the act, even if the general public forgets, which is what their evidence is about. The voters, like swing voters and black voters who care most about CJR, won't forget because it's their priority. Great power work is not obsolete. They've dropped that it does not assume the world of the app. Post re election, Trump does literally whatever he wants, pulls out of NATO. And institutions collapse, etc., which means war is more likely. The Constitutional Convention Town Plan theory is a reason to reject the argument, not the team. We're not going for it, which solves any abuse. But they've dropped that skew as inevitable because we could have read more tier case arguments, which is terminal defense any theory argument. The framing page proper, you should prioritize existential threats, even if there's a low risk of the disadvantage. If we win any risk, any risk, then the disadvantage comes before the affirmative because it's the only existential risk. Three reasons to prioritize. Of one, it's irreversible. Yes, they stop 66 deaths on death row, but that is at the cost of the death of every single person on earth. We can't go back or, or we can't go back and fix that, and we can't do the act before all dead, which means it comes first. Second is cognitive bias. We're cognitively biased to disregard large impact scenarios because things like the extinction of the entire human race is obviously difficult to imagine. You should overcorrect and assume our scenarios are much more probable than you think they are for that reason. Third is that even if if we prioritize structural violence, nuclear war still comes first because it causes more structural violence through poverty, pandemics, etc. Their arguments are all essentially probability first. One, the disadvantage is not no low probability. They need to beat it in order to beat that. They have evidence about why low probability scenarios are bad, but no evidence as to why the disadvantage is low probability. Second, it links to all of their internal link arguments because they're unsure about whether the app will, will, will solve, which means that uncertainty is inevitable. Third, even if it's low probability and we're winning that extinction is so bad we should prioritize it anyway but that this first is silly nothing is always bad proven by how killing hitler would have been a good idea even if death and killing is bad writ large the advantage proper the status quo solves courts will abolish the death penalty we should wait because that prevents extinction via the this side courts will feel pressured by states court uh, the states abolishing the lethal injection is part of them abolishing the death penalty because lethal injection is what allows the death penalty to occur even the any delay is not bad in the world that it prevents extinction. It's obviously necessary because the courts would act to not look outdated. Awesome example of a very solid 2NR. Um, while the 2AR is preparing their final speech, now there's a couple things that you know, we can know in terms of what that 2AR is going to do. It's probably not going to talk about the counter plan. It's um, probably going to focus on the case and comparing the impacts of the case to the impacts of the dissent. Um, and how do I know that? Well, the 2NR collapsed down on the case debate. It got, uh, started the case debate with about a minute um, and spent of that minute 40 seconds comparing impacts in 20 seconds, extending just one substantive response to the case. And I think that is um, a pretty effective strategy in this case because everyone agrees essentially that the app only affects um, you know, a, a small subset of individuals, um, at least in the immediate term. Um, and that the disad um, could affect, depending on what probability ultimately gets assigned to any of its um, you know, link chains or the terminal impact um, ultimately affects far more people. And so 
um, winning that the affirmative doesn't actually save those, um, as as it says, uh, 66 people. I'm not sure if that's exactly the right number, but I'm not sure myself. Um, but uh, regardless of what that number is, spending a lot of time demonstrating that the app doesn't solve that number of people is probably not as valuable as winning that that you know saving those people isn't worth risking extinction right like in the big picture of things there are bigger fish to fry here um the other thing that i want well actually let's check in with uh, mrs phillips and see if there's any insights from the flow that she'd like to share uh, uh one thing that and i guess McCaffrey, you actually already kind of said this, but I, I do like the fact that it is boiled down. Um, notice that the two and R was not as, I guess, line by line, so to speak, in responding to every 1AR extension, but instead kind of organizes according to the story that she wants to tell in the debate, which I think is very smart. So the 2NR and the 2AR have a little bit more leeway in the sense of they're supposed to be telling a more cohesive spin and story and putting the arguments in context of each other as opposed to just like singularly answering like the XO is not good enough. But notice when she talks about that, it's like the XO creates the brink and that's why CJR becomes more important and the first step act was an action but insufficient and then goes on to talk about how single issue voters will actually care about these particular um, issues more, but which means they don't actually forget them and the election's not too far away, but then also that um, it is sufficient. So maybe one area to kind of focus on, notice that kind of plays in to the 1AR story as well, that the single issue voters then know the difference between the death penalty and like police brutality policies. So now the question is, which one of them is the 2NR or the 2AR going to be more persuasive about that link story? Because I suspect that the 2AR is going to be partly going for that same exact story that the 1AR started to tell or if I was the 2AR, I think I would start to go for that story. So, um, you know, thinking about the context of, of how you build persuasive stories and persuasive arguments in the 2NR and the 2AR. Thank you. Um, to extrapolate on that, some of the, the things I noticed about the language that the 2NR was using, um, I think kind of can be, thought of as examples of contextualizing um, that Mrs. Phillips was just talking about. Like, um, while I think the entire speech is easy to follow and understand, it's clear. It's making um, kind of shorter sentences um, that are, are easy to, to understand uh, in the moment. There are moments where Ozzy slows down just a, just a little bit and speaks a little bit louder to emphasize. Moments like, this is not what the AF does. Moments like black swans do not matter, right? Like just that little bit of emphasis and slowing down um, makes those phrases really jump out at you. And they're both examples of attempts to resolve the disagreements that previous speeches had identified as like the nexus questions here. So language like, even if they're right, we should still win because, or even or language like this does not assume this other factor um, are ways of discussing and referencing the disagreement that's already happened and making an effort to resolve that disagreement or to instruct the judge on how the judge should resolve that disagreement in a way that favors your side. Um, and I think that that's excellent example um, of what we call argument resolution, the, the job of the final speeches that is different from any other speech um, that had happened up until that point in the debate round. Um, ultimately, these speeches, as you can see, are all about making decisions um, and trying to, you know, write the judge's ballot and the reason for that judge's decision before um, they even, you know, the other team even has an opportunity to respond in the case of the 2NR. Um, so anticipating what the 2AR might say and undermining it. Um, and that, those are very advanced skills. It'll probably take you a while before you get good at it, but there's certainly things that um, you can start doing now, and these are really, really great examples 
of what that looks like, what that sounds like, what language it uses, and you know how that language is, is subtly different from the language that was used in previous speeches to merely articulate and clarify what the disagreements are. Um, the, let's see. You all are going to have to be giving um, your own decision um, in terms of who won this debate and writing out your own reasons for that decision. And I hope that you'll um, you know, keep these uh, moments of argument resolution in mind as you're doing so. Try to keep uh, maybe circle on your flow uh, what you think are the most important pivot points in the debate or the key questions that you think um, a decision might boil down to and try to uh, reference how you resolve those in the debate. Like ultimately, um, hopefully you're approaching judging this debate almost like doing math, like not necessarily making one initial decision about who won, but looking at each of the key points, seeing who won them, and then seeing what that math adds up to in terms of who ultimately wins the overall debate. All right, looks like Margaret is ready. I'm good. All right. Then if you can give us a roadmap, um, and then whenever you are ready. No, I'm not. Okay. Um, so it is framing. Um, and then the advantage and then the disadvantage. Am I good for everyone? Yeah. We are far ahead on the really totalitarianism ethics first question of the debate, which means you default laugh. You need to reject the death penalty. In all instances, its existence causes moral disengagement and selective empathy that justifies committing physical and psychological violence against populations we deem unsafe. Once you accept the logic that underpins genocide once, we lose the empathy to reject genocide in other instances. That cumin of logic means it justifies war and conflict in the future, which means that even if they were utilitarianism, being complicit in the death penalty causes far causes more conflict in the future, it causes more Come in the future, torture is never justifiable. And the 2020 election dissent should not hold the lives of people on death row hostage. That's the Johnson and the Weiwei Wei evidence. We have two more reasons why their framing is bad, which is offense for us. And because conceding the two in our first is a decision paralysis argument. It's that our model is the best. The, the framing debate is a question of the best overall model of action, not just case versus the dissent, which is conceding the two in our infinite risks could cause extinction in a world where you kill probability and asteroid could hit Earth tomorrow, which means obviously they could, they can never solve extinction. It's a question of broader action, but in a world where anything could kill us, we'll never be able to act because there's inevitably going to be some sort of trade-off between solving one extinction here and another, which causes paralysis. Second, it causes anxiety-driven policymaking, arms racing, Iraq war, immigration camps, etc. all prove the utilitarianism and the, and, the, and the logic of the greater good justifies worse violence in the short term, which is uniquely bad. The framing line by line, the reversibility argument here, they obviously don't get it if we just prove some risk of the dissat. Second, cognitive biases flow out because the two in our job cognitive a dissonance with I just well, which I already explained above. Third is the nuclear war trans structural violence argument. We'll disprove the dissent, but the two in our conceded it's not just what it's not just a question of what causes structural violence, but whether or not that we have chosen a specific so we've chosen a specific structural framework, i.e., torture needs to come first, and you should operate under that. Even though, even if structural violence still happens in a world post app, you're still the two in our still concedes that you prioritize just torture writ large, uh, the torture writ large, which is best. The, the, the uncertainty argument here, uncertainty obviously is inevitable if we. As we win case, the advantage. The status quo doesn't solve the one in scene two, and are both conceded their evidence that their, their, their evidence says circuit courts might hear a case about the death penalty, but it does not make a war and is not highlighted that they'll call it that they'll cause the Supreme Court to rule because of pressure. Even says that the pressure will result in the courts hearing a case, but it does not say that they'll rule in favor of the app, which means this argument isn't true. It's not warranted, and it doesn't take out case that was conceded in the two and R, the 2020 dissent. At the top, there's no the, at the top, there's no turns case. The human dignity analysis was new in the two and R. The only turns case warrant the one in R had was a white supremacy argument, which we said was about the four previous years of the four previous years of Trump. I shouldn't have to answer new two and R arguments because there's not enough time in the because there's not enough time uh, there's not enough time in the in the, in the one in R. The, the, there's no link. There's three the, the no link because of the court's three liberal court rulings 
on immigration, LGBTQ rights, abortion, and DACA are all things that Trump hates, which makes, which makes him seem separated from the courts because they have different political backgrounds, which is dropped in the two and There's fundamentally no link to the disab. The executive order also thumps their three arguments first. All their evidence is not about the app. It's very generic. It only says that CJR is important and should cause a flip. The two and can see that there's no link threshold in their evidence for what flip is sufficient, which means that which means that the Trump's executive order should be enough to thumb because it did things like ban chokeholds, which is still material form. Second, the only answer was that activists don't like it. It's irrelevant because obviously people who are activists, like the people who are like BLM activists, wouldn't flip for Trump. No, wouldn't flip for Trump no matter what. The analysis about the executive order creating the perception that Trump wants reform, but not but not but but not being credible enough is not warranted in their evidence whatsoever in the two and I it's not warranted in their evidence whatsoever in the two and R. The dissad is the dissad link evidence is just not specific enough for you to feel comfortable voting on it in a world or in, in a world where we have we where we have a thumper because they're arguing about it, about the perception being uncredible is not warranted. I already said that it did things like ban chokeholds, which is material which is material. The death penalty specific link isn't a link to this dissad. Their evidence just says that people care about the death penalty, but not that it's relevant to the 2020 election or that it'll specifically flip or that it'll specifically um, flip voters. People will forget because of oversaturated oversaturated media streams, oversaturated media streams with Corona news and the economy, etc. Which means that the which means that the app is only drop in a bucket, especially combined with the fact that it's a court ruling. Anybody else who wasn't thump, who wasn't flipped by the executive order thumper is terminally anti-Trump because of Corona response and economic downturn and lack of gun control action, which also thumped the dissad. That was the Harnoski evidence and was conceded in the two and R. There's no neg impact. Our alliance's deployment of power projection has been fine for the first four for the first four years of Trump. There's no impact. Why the next one? There's no reason why the next four years are unique. Even if it emboldens Trump more, the two and R had no real impact extension explaining what possible scenario or what things Trump would be more likely to do in a second term, which means that there's no real risk of this impact. They haven't told you what type of scenario would happen, just that things might be worse. Sure, things might be worse, but they, have, but they haven't said why our alliances can't solve a terminal impact. There's no impact explanation in the two and R, which means you go down. Awesome. Thank you all so much for doing this with us. Um, just such a fantastic uh, example of exactly um, the kinds of, you know, good behaviors that we're hoping that uh, many students can emulate. Um, and I, I just hope everybody, uh, I'm sure they do, joins me in thanking you for giving us some of your so precious time um, out of you know, doing your own work for Debate Camp to come and help us. Um, and yeah, thank you. Um, I don't think that you all need to stay um, for the rest of this. Um, well, do if, we do we want to allow questions like Q and A from the students really quickly? Um, I would that... have, but no one has asked any for the entire. Time. Oh yeah, that's fair. Okay. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at. So. <laughs> Thank you kids. so much, you all. You would hear everybody clapping if we were all there in person. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank, thank you for you. having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right. So the 33 of you who are still with us, 32 now, 31. Um, if you, if you're from our lab, we